Hi everyone, welcome to the data series. We are thrilled to be with you here this evening for a session full of action packed learning. My name is Jaskira Singh and I'm a member of data science team here at Antics Vidya. I'll be your moderator for this session. Our session today is on lessons learned from hundreds of machine learning projects. Before we kick things off, on to our presenter today. I am delighted to be joined by Prashant Dhingra, who is our presenter today. Prashant Dhingra is the Managing Director for Machine Learning at JP Morgan Chase. Since 2008, he's, he has worked on variety of ML models and has a good experience of 28 years. Prior to JPMC, he has worked at Google and Microsoft. At Google, he was the head of machine learning for manufacturing and industry. At Microsoft, he worked on Azure ML, Bing, and SQL Server team. Prashant has also written a book on SQL Server and has a chapter on ML in NOAA book. Over to Prashant now. Um, thanks a lot. Um, hello, everyone. Um, great to be here today. Uh, so do let me know any questions you have. Um, I will uh, get started with the session. As mentioned, um, I started working as a software engineer in 93. And uh, after working 15 years as a software engineer, I moved to operationalizing machine learning. That's where in 2008, I got um, involved in machine learning. And then slowly I started learning about machine learning and then um, got deeper understanding about machine learning. Since 2008, I've been working on machine learning. So today I will uh, share various learning um, I had at Microsoft and Google. Uh, and um, I will keep this at a generic level so that we are not sharing any public information uh, or not sharing any non-public information. And uh, I will not go into any JP Morgan or any finance detail, but I hope that you will like these learnings useful um, because otherwise we have to work on many projects and then we realize that, okay, things work in a different way in a software versus machine learning. Okay, so I will share my screen. Um, um, and we'll get started. Okay. Can you see my screen? Uh, should I proceed? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the agenda for today will be what kind of a um, lesson we can learn while working on variety of machine learning project. These lessons are in variety of areas like how the product development should happen differently. Um, how if companies are um, starting new or uh, if you are trying to start a startup, how you should think differently about machine learning how you should organize your experimentation, how the model development cycle should be organized and uh, what kind of a um, uh, things you should organize for handling data, feature engineering, operationalization, et cetera. Um, so I believe we will only be able to cover this much. Uh, in future, we can cover more items or if the time permits today, I have slides for uh, uh, other topics like how you can combine psychology and machine learning because AI and machine learning work together, how to combine them together. I have a few examples also how to simplify or change the requirement for machine learning, but probably we will cover these in future session. Okay, so let's get started. So uh, just to um, um, lay the foundation, um, in software, we believe that complex problem can be solved by first understanding the problem, writing the problem in detail, and then uh, specify its solution top down. So that was the approach we used in software. Uh, we use top down approach. Sometimes we use bottoms up approach also or mixed approach. But mostly it is like you think about the problem and then you determine how you will code the solution. Uh, one foundational difference is um, machine learning has taught us that how we can solve the problems by learning from data without even fully understanding the problem. And even if it sounds very simple, it has a lot of impact how you should uh, design ML-based product or how, how you should determine what is feasible, what is not feasible. So key difference is machine learning projects are mostly bottoms of um, project. Now let's dig this further. Um, if you 
um, if you take example of how software industry is formed, um, let's say uh, I worked at Microsoft, Microsoft used to um, think about what solutions are required. Uh, for example, database is required and like SQL Server was built, a coding tool was required, so Visual Studio was built. And these were coded once and then packaged into CDs and then it was uh, shipped to all the customers. So basically find a problem, code, um, code a solution, package this as a product and sh ship it into CDs. Nowadays you can download it. Like for example, if you buy TurboTax or if you buy any other software, Adobe, uh, you download those software. The philosophy is code once and sell thousands of times. Now this philosophy doesn't work in a ML domain. And it is a it has a big impact because uh, let's say if you are trying to start a company and you think that, okay, you can build something and you will sell it to hundreds of customers or even companies like Microsoft and Google, when they want to build ML-based product, this philosophy of writing code once and selling thousands of time doesn't work because in ML domain, ML is bottoms up, you need to change code to fit different data. So writing code once and selling it thousand times doesn't work and uh, code needs to fit to the data. That means code needs to be customized for the data. Um, uh, so you can't package it once and sell it. Uh, as a result, you can't have that business model that you will build something and you will be able to simply sell it to customer and say, okay, here is a solution, use it. Um, and that makes the product development uh, business model very different. Uh, and that's the reason though, you will see in ML domain more and more open source uh, packages um, are created, uh, which are free so that you can get the open source package and then you can uh, write on top of it or you can change the algorithm to fit to your code. Now the impact is if you want to make money by building an algorithm, it has become much harder in a ML domain. Other factor is also um, in ML domain, a human in loop is used. So generally machine learning will predict something and somebody and, uh, will later verify or give feedback that okay, whether ML prediction was good or not good and those feedback needs to be incorporated. So human in loop approach also makes building ML product much harder. And then uh, there is a third impact of it. Um, plurality of method required in ML domain is very high. So let me explain this again. When you build any software, you build software based upon, okay, how much data you have, what whether it is a batch or whether it is streaming, you can choose data set or databases according to whether you need to use SQL or when, whether you need to use NoSQL. Those are, those architecture decisions are made based upon type of data, velocity of data. But when you are doing modeling, you are making decision based upon the content of the data. So the variety in content of data is very high. As a result, the plurality of method required in modeling is very high. And because plurality in modeling is very high, it becomes harder to code one thing and ship it to thousand customers. That code needs to be changed multiple times for each customer. Um, so that, um, that has been a significant difference uh, and more, um, it may sound simple, but most companies also realize it much later when they build ML product and then they realize that it doesn't work. Okay. So now we will talk more about the modeling and how, uh, what kind of a learnings we had from there. So just to deep dive, uh, let's take example cases. Gen generally, you will have a classification or regression cases in ML. So imagine if you need to predict which vehicle will fail. So this is a machine learning classification problem. Or imagine if you could predict what is the remaining life of a machine. This is a regression problem. Or um, can you optimize the energy consumption? This is more of a optimization or reinforcement learning problem. So three example, classification, re uh, regression, 
um, and optimization. So, uh, so you can have a variety of use cases. Um, so as you start machine learning project, uh, you should think about um, who is the customer, who is the user, what is the business problem, whether it is a classification, regression, uh, or optimization problem, why to use uh, machine learning, like should a software model should be used instead of machine learning, uh, simple rule-based software, or um, will ML will be improving the existing use case, or it is a new use case altogether, which can be solved by uh, ML. So example will be uh, many times text classification scenarios are new and they are generally uh, done by machine learning. But if you are trying to determine what is the remaining life of a machine, one can write rules uh, and those systems are already in place and ML <coughs> adds value on top of that. Um, then uh, you should also think about that is this area is feasible? Is it already proven? There is enough research exist, other people have done it or not. You should uh, also determine whether um, ML here is boosting what has been coded as a rule or ML has been used from scratch. Then you should think more about what are the data sources? Do you have the access to the right data? Are there any ethical, legal, compliance, privacy requirement uh, of using those data? And then generally ML solutions are for generating revenue, for saving cost, for improving safety, improving compliance. You should also think about ROI in that terms. And uh, if you are generating revenue, what will be your pricing model? You, you will um, charge customer once or it will be uh, how um, like pay as you go kind of a model and then how you will maintain the solution specifically when a human in the loop uh, approach uh, is required. So, so just to recap, we talked about, you should think about which type of use cases you are going to use. Um, generally ML modeler consider that whether it is a classification regression or optimization problem. But in addition, uh, these are the uh, business aspect of the use case you should consider the customer, user, what kind of a benefit they will get, why you are solving it through machine learning, et cetera. Once you have captured this detail, it will help you converting this business use case into a ML use case. Then you should uh, call it out correctly. It's a classification problem or regression problem because many times business will just give you a vague thing in the beginning. Um, so you should um, uh, document your business use case that uh, business problem and all the items I mentioned in the previous slide, who are your user customer flow of events functionality. And then you should try to convert this into a ML use case, uh, how ML will improve the existing rule based system or will it work from scratch? Then um, what you are going to predict, whether it is a class or it is a um, some uh, continuous value uh, and uh, what kind of a signals you will be relying on, what kind of a data sets we will be relying on, and then uh, how you will measure the result. So take a use case, convert into a ML use case, and then take this further and convert this into a hypothesis. Um, for example, um, business may say they want to um, improve or um, uh, like when these batteries will fail. And you need to work with them to determine whether you want to determine remaining battery life or you want to know um, in which month it will fail. Once you have narrowed down to, let's say, uh, class, uh, it's a classification problem, you again need to specify your hypothesis. Uh, for example, will this equipment will fail in next one month or what is the probability of failing in next one week versus next two weeks, next three week and four week. So uh, you should call out your hypothesis um, um, correctly. Many times customer will say, okay, I want to know whether there will be a maintenance required in this car or is in, in this vehicle, but uh, then vehicle is uh, consists of many parts. So then you need to um, again, um, expand this hypothesis like, okay, will this vehicle will fail due to part X or due to part Y? Um, so expand that ML use case into a formal uh, hypothesis. And um, <clears throat> once you define a hypothesis, then uh, define a matrix that how you will um, evaluate it. 
So a uh, couple of guidelines for uh, matrices, many use cases, when you will talk to customers, they will talk about variety of matrices and it's okay to use many matrices, um, but um, ML model or ML hypothesis uh, focus on one matrix. So you should, you should narrow down on one matrix you will be optimizing for, and you can have additional matrix as a satisfactory criteria. But um, um, your loss function, et cetera, needs to uh, depend upon one matrix. So narrow down on that. And few other guidelines that uh, when you design a matrix, uh, many times people will say, okay, if I am using algorithm one, I will use this matrix. If I'm using algorithm two, I'm using that matrix. So that should not happen. Metric design and model design are two independent items. So you should design your matrix and then whether you are going to use decision tree or whether you are going to use a deep neural network, it should be independent from matrix and matrix should be independent from model design. And uh, other property of matrices is like, um, same model should produce similar number on similar data. So it should be reliable. And other thing is it should be easy to build specifically when you are in the beginning of the cycle. Some of the matrices, let's say, um, when you are dealing with a complex time series data, some of the matrices are quite complex. Um, and in the beginning, you should um, you should uh, come out with a simple matrix and later you can expand and um, um, add more complexity to your matrix. So in the beginning, keep your matrix simple. So we talked about um, identify your AI business use case and convert this business use case to ML use case, whether it is a classification, regression, optimization problem, and then convert this into a formal hypothesis in maths form and then agree the matrix and here are the properties of the matrix. So these are some of the learnings. Uh, one additional thing um, you should worry about, I wanted to put a detailed slide, but uh, I didn't get enough time. Um, so this is a topic in itself. Uh, you should also think what is your ML target state because the, uh, that will impact how you should design your environment. So what do I mean by ML target state? So let's say somebody comes and says, oh, I want to determine can, can machine learning be used to predict when a battery failure will happen. So they just want to know whether it is feasible or not. So some problems are that customer just wants to know the feasibility. And at this stage, you should not worry about automation or end-to-end -end pipeline. So you should consider um, what is your target state. And I've summarized these five points based upon um, one of the uh, Google paper that uh, what is your ML test score. Um, so I, um, these five topics um, are inspired from, uh, from that paper. Uh, so if it is a research and feasibility project, determine uh, that your goal is to only prove the feasibility. In some cases, um, other people have done similar work. Uh, now you are dealing with a different data. So uh, your goal may be to determine whether in, you, based upon the data set you have, can you, um, can you build a model or not? Uh, again, you are going further than feasibility, but um, you are basically trying to prove what others have done. Can you do it in your data set and uh, proving the feasibility in your environment? Uh, then the third state can be, somebody may say, um, okay, if I change the price of my product, how much of my customer will uh, uh, continue to use it? And so they, they are asking for a one-time insight or they are asking for some what-if analysis um, or um, let's say some disease happened and somebody wants to know why it happened. So uh, again, this is a modeling exercise, um, but there is a difference between when you are building a model for one-time usage versus um, uh, when you are building a model for a production usage. So for example, text classification, image classification, people will build a model and they will like to operationalize it. And then every day new data will come, the model will work in production. That, um, that needs to use different approaches versus if you are doing a one-time casual inference. So the third category is one-time, the fourth category is you, uh, you need to deploy the model in production. The fifth category is called mission critical model. This is similar to fourth category, um, 
but um, the reason it's important to keep it separate is um, uh, if if you have a business, let's say Google has a Google search engine, Google Maps, uh, versus um, uh, if you have a um, um, like a HR department who is uh, uh, checking that okay, uh, how many people uh, are um, looking at the uh, resumes um, uh, on the job site? These two are of different uh, different type. Uh, because when you are building a mission critical system, your whole business relies on the uh, on it, and uh, a lot of people are using it. So you need to have a very strong automation. You need to have a very strong diagnostic procedures, um, whether they are technical diagnostic or whether they are legal diagnostic uh, in place. So mission critical system need to have those things in place. Versus um, model in production means, uh, you, you, let's say you have a um, system working on it and now you, you have enhanced with the ml model and it uh, or uh, you have users who were uh, doing their job and now they are gaining some additional benefit uh, so your business will not break if if your model break um, uh, but in the mission critical system your whole business model will break if your model breaks so you need to uh, you need to determine what is your target state. And this is a one hour topic in itself. I have a, a big slide, like what kind of a capabilities you should be putting in each category. So I will try to summarize it again. So if you are build, proving a feasibility, you um, convert a use case into ML use case, you document your hypothesis, you get the data set, and many times you are open that whether you will use one data set or three data set, and you will prove whether your hypothesis is valid or not. So you will validate or invalidate a hypothesis. That will be the goal of the category one. Goal of category two will be um, some other people have done it. They have a paper or uh, you know that other companies are successful in this area. Uh, your skill set is new or your data is new. You will try to apply those approaches on your data and uh, and you will see whether you can build a model. So that is building a reliable model. Um, so at the, in these kind of stages, you will not worry too much about what kind of a uh, code review procedure you have or whether you have unit test or not, because you are just focusing on feasibility piece of it. But if you are now using a model to generate an insight, you want to ensure that you have a code review, feature review in place. You are only using features which you are allowed to use um, and um, and uh, uh, you will ensure that the insight you are generating for business uh, are robust. So, um, so some software engineering principle will get added into this category. In fourth category, you will, um, in third category, you may not have any automation. You collect data, you may do it on your desk, but in fourth category, then there is automation, there is a production environment, and you will use now production control features. Fifth category, you will go even further. You will have a diagnostic procedure in place where you have a full automation without a human involvement and you will have a experimentation environment. You have a back testing environment and you should be able to have things like uh, how much your metrics deteriorated between training and production, validation and production, training versus validation, training versus back testing. And you should be able to automatically see how much of data drifts are happening. Is there a data quality issue? So again, we talked about use cases, uh, hypothesis and metrics. Those are useful in determining um, what kind of a model you will be building and which metrics you'll be evaluating. Now you should think about what kind of a target state you want to achieve and accordingly choose the right environmental control or the procedure um, uh, and um, then either prove feasibility or take model from feasibility to prod. And it may happen in the beginning, you will prove feasibility and now you will say you want to go to stage three or go, go to stage four and later you may go to stage five. Okay. So sometime in future, we can do a session on this topic itself. Okay. Now let's talk about experimentation. Uh, our the lesson learned on experimentation. So, in experimentation, um, you have a hypothesis, and you want to determine whether this hypothesis is valid or invalid. And many of you have learned this 
in variety of university courses, you write a notebook, you validate or invalidate a hypothesis. Uh, the challenge in real life is uh, the real life hypotheses are much harder. And many times you have to run thousands of experiment before and you only find two or three good candidates um, where you get the result. And you will see a lot of failed experiment and only a couple of uh, successful experiment. Um, so this makes life very hard because a company who have hired you is only looking for success, specifically in software, the management chain and executives only want to invest time in successful thing and not in the failure thing. Uh, other is like um, you need to be able to run these thousands of experiment yourself. And if um, unlike university project where each person code a notebook, you can't code all of these notebooks. So if you take any health example or any complex time series data example, these experiment needs to be coded and uh, then you need to try a variety of features to determine which item will give you the result. And uh, to how to do it, I will come back to this slide. Um, so let me explain an analogy. Um, so Andrew Dog also used this analogy, uh, in the analogy of orthogonal knobs. So you should be able to determine how complex your experiments are and whether you will be running five or 10 experiments and trying five, 10 different uh, types of features or you need to run hundreds or thousands of experiment. Because if there are five or 10, you probably can code it by hand. But if you are working in a domain where uh, it needs, you need to try th thousands of combination, you will not be able to do all, everything by hand. Um, so the um, analogy here is, let's take uh, two example, washing machine or, or a car. Uh, washing machine has has um, button. Uh, it is uh, sitting at home. You put the cloth and you choose the conditions and press the button and everything is fully automated. Um, once you choose what kind of a load you have, um, how much time you want to run, it determines how much water to use, how much electricity, and it runs smoothly. So it's a complete automation and <clears throat> every company wants to achieve that complete automation. Versus if you take an example of a car, uh, car has steering wheel, car has brake, car has accelerator um, um, and gears. So you use these four or five types of control, steering wheel, accelerator, brakes, and using this, you can take the car to a hill, you can take car to a highway, you can take car on a smaller road. So the philosophy here is you should be able to determine whether you are going to use a, a washing machine philosophy or car philosophy. So what a washing machine has given you is a complete automation. You choose the condition and it works. What car has given it to you, these are the orthogonal knobs, um, steering wheel and accelerator. In experimentation, when you need to navigate your hypothesis space, it may be better to design these knobs for your domain. Because if you can design the knobs for your domain like steering wheel and accelerator, then using those, you can run thousands of experiment. You can navigate the whole hypothesis space. You will not be able to do it by hand. Now, this, this is actually quite hard. It seems easy because these knobs are also domain specific and going back to um, um, the first example, ML product, um, many companies are selling product that, okay, buy this product and you will be able to experiment, et cetera. But those are not domain specific and those things only track your experiment. None of them gives you orthogonal knobs. So you have to design this for for the domain you have. And companies spend years, sometimes decade before they realize it. And smaller company even doesn't realize it uh, or companies, even big enterprises who are new that real life experiments, if you are working in a complex environment, you first need to design these knobs. You should need to under understand your hypothesis space 
and once you design these knobs you will be able to uh, then try those thousands of things within your hypothesis space so let me go back to the previous example so first you need to experiment and you need you should be able to try all these things and using the hypothesis um, using these knobs you will be able to try this then you will run into other challenges that um, once you um, once you code the experiment then you need to um, test that okay your matrix results are good and you need to work on training test validation set then you also needs to do a back testing on it you need to try these things in a different environment then you need to take it to pre prod specifically if you are working in a mission critical system then you need to take it to prod and the data keeps on changing all the time so then that means you should be able to debug thing again so um um so if you design these knobs well not only you solve the experimentation problem you also integrate experimentation to production and that gives you a huge advantage uh, and um, these these are the things i learned at microsoft and google that when they build mission critical system using these knobs we were able to run many different experiments and uh, then you can uh, um, like a business user can have hypothesis business user means like um, um, even uh, data scientist who are expert if they have a hypothesis and if it takes 3 months um, for them to code it will be very hard so using these knobs they can test out you know, various hypotheses by changing the knobs and um, um, running into your experimentation environment so this is a key for proving the feasibility and this is a key for taking things to production uh, as well as building mission critical system so earlier we talked about target state it it is used in many target states so now let's talk about what method to use um when you are building a model so um uh, if you are getting bored um um the, just to use an analogy hopefully it will be little bit more fun so uh, the analogy or story here is um there was a village and they wanted to uh, eat food and they hired an elephant elephant every day goes into the forest and bring food for everyone and if it doesn't find food in one direction it goes into the second direction and villagers were unhappy because elephant if it finds food it it brings lot of food but if it doesn't find food then they have to sleep um empty stomach so the second village i uh, thought they will not do this error and they hired a monkey now monkey is um, monkey can jump on trees uh, and it can go into 20 30 different direction so if it doesn't find the food in one direction it goes into second direction third direction fourth direction so monkey always find the food but uh, the challenge uh, with the second village was monkey is so small that it can carry only little food so these village get food every day but they get so little that they also got unhappy so then they got together and they came out with an approach um that how elephant and monkey needs to work together so every day monkey goes in the morning it finds the food in which direction the food is it comes back it sits on elephant back and show that direction to elephant and then elephant and monkey bring food for both the village so the approach works for both the village okay so why we use this story so you are going to work on model you need to operationalize this model um monkey here is research and elephant here is an execution and um, you will um, you will see this challenge that what kind of a approach you should use uh, whether you should be using agile approach whether you should be having a more controlled approach and every team struggles with it and executive will like you to give them the plan up front that when you will be delivering the result 
and, um, and they will like to know how much of the ROI they will be getting. And these things are uh, very hard and sometimes even, even wrong to us. So the philosophy I used with those executives are, we should, uh, we should consider what are the monkey tasks and what are the elephant tasks. So bef um, in a software, you can, um, you, you can design what kind of a ROI you will be getting, or you can design uh, and estimate what kind of a, um, uh, whether you will be able to deliver in three months or six months. So monkey tasks are much higher agile tasks. Uh, at this stage, you are trying to figure out in which direction the food is. Um, so you do not know whether the third iteration will give you the result or 30th iteration will give you the result. And you do not know whether you will get food in one direction or you have to go in two or three different directions. So those questions are less relevant and should not be asked in a monkey task phase. And goal of the monkey task is so that you can determine how much will be the ROI and how much will be the cost of going into that direction. So having that philosophy help in convincing executive, ha having this philosophy also help um, uh, agreeing with your team that, okay, um, area where you have ambiguity and area where you should have clarity. So when you are doing a elephant task, you should have a clarity. You are going into certain direction why you are going. When you are using a monkey task, you do not know. Um, so I, I hope you like this analogy. Uh, and uh, as you design your uh, project management process or uh, uh, execution process or agile process or release rhythm, um, uh, uh, consider this philosophy and design accordingly. That will, um, that will ease a lot of um, things and it will help uh, team and executive bring on the same page. Okay. Now, uh, once you understand that uh, philosophies of tasks that require higher agility versus tasks require less, um, um, then you should uh, consider uh, what are the variety of tasks and what kind of a process is required for each task. So uh, this diagram is from a paper like how behavior of ML uh, solution uh, is different than a software solution. Uh, so generally in software, we use unit test, integration test, system test. Uh, in ML, you have this additional dimension of data that you're, you, um, in software, you're testing your code, but in ML, your code is training on your data and it is trying to fit on the data and your data is changing. That creates a lot of additional challenge. So process for managing this data is different than managing the code and uh, the kind of test or kind of process you should be using are quite different. Um, so it may sound simple, but most companies have done this mistake that they treat core objects uh, and data object in a similar manner. So for example, uh, various things like um, um, you will have a variety of environment, unit test environment, integration test environment, um, system test environment, and every environment um, you check in the code and then you deploy the things into these environment and you test. Now, and Many companies even today do same thing with ML, like they will bring the code and they will bring the data into these environments. But um, you can create copies of code into different environment. You can use version control on code. Uh, it doesn't work on data. So you should find opportunity, do ML where data is, and that will change your philosophy, how you should design this environment. Again, this is a big topic in itself, but um, one learning is code and data objects are very different. You should not treat uh, them in the same manner. Okay, so um, it is a big topic, but now uh, I just want to summarize this, that when you are running an end-to-end -end system, let's say mission critical system, it's not only ML model, you have a infrastructure, you have a software, you have a data coming in and you have a model. And um, a mission critical system error may happen anywhere. So let's say if Google search is not working or Bing search is not working, um, you need to determine whether your servers are down or um, uh, your load balancer was not working or your uh, some code 
um, um, that um, application code stopped working or some process stopped working or whether you end up training on a wrong data or the data pipeline that is you are making inference on have gone wrong or your model that is producing the result that has gone wrong. So you need to design an ML system that consider all these things together. And most companies have separate thing for model and separate thing for software, but a mission critical system error can happen at every at any of these place. And you need to have a diagnostic procedures in place, uh, which are integrated. Um, so, so that you can look into your logs and traces, you can look into, okay, what kind of a data uh, went into training, what kind of a data you are getting uh, now for inference. And then uh, you should be able to determine whether you are, yeah, you have a data drift or your label got changed or your model started going wrong. Um, and uh, going back to earlier slide, uh, as you design this integrated process, um, there are tasks which uh, where you need to be more agile versus there are tasks where, where you need to be less agile and code and data should be um, dealt differently. So this is a very big topic. Um, these are the pointers like how um, ML development is different from software as well as when you combine ML development with software development, how should you, how you should think end to end. Okay. So based upon this, uh, you should define a process which is a combination of software development process as well as machine learning development process. Uh, and um, you can define a software sprint and then in, um, you can also have a data sprint and uh, you can have an experimentation sprint. So the reason I'm calling them out separately is in a software sprint, you can have a clear goal that, okay, what you will achieve in, uh, in, you know, in certain sprint, in an experimentation sprint, you may not have a clear goal because you are focusing on proving the feasibility. Okay. So we talked about use cases, we talked about matrices, we talked about um, uh, process. Uh, now, somebody who is, who is the scrum master or who is a project manager or who is the ML lead, um, will be overseeing this. And most companies think that they will hire data scientists and their current project manager or lead will basically track the project. And that is the number one reason for project failing. The, the reason is, um, so I use this code to convince everyone that um, uh, MIT has this code that model development is a different um, than traditional software development. So rather than uh, just using oversight and planning, managing a data science uh, project. So if you're managing a data science project, these are much more dynamic and it means this is a self-correcting process. So, uh, so if you take an example of a ML project, we, we took an example of monkey and elephant task. Uh, in a software project, you will say, oh, um, uh, here is a goal, here is an estimate and here are the number of resources. And now you put a plan and if you're falling behind, you will add more resources. But in ML domain, you are first of all, you are dependent upon data. If your data is changing and if your data doesn't have a pattern, no matter how many resources you put, you know, your project will not work. So somebody who is leading the ML project should understand these moving parts. They should be able to determine, not only they should be able to track, like their goal should be, can they reduce the research iteration? Can they reduce the monkey iteration? So take this example, if you are working on a project, it may not be giving you a result. And somebody may think, okay, I will use different modeling architecture or a different algorithm. That's what like most of the data scientists want to do. But many times different algorithm doesn't solve a problem. Uh, getting more data solve a problem. Um, and then you need to focus on acquiring newer data. Sometimes even more data doesn't help. You need to get different type of data. Sometimes you need to change your sampling philosophy. Uh, Sometimes you need to have fewer uh, few more labels or you need to use additional approaches called active learning. So whether it is a more data problem, different data problem, different compute problem, different algorithm problem, 
each of these iteration may take you three to six months. So whoever is leading the ML project, uh, they should be able to reduce the iteration. So if you think in monkey and elephant term, um, um, you are sending your monkey into different direction and each things take effort. If a person can utilize their prior experience and they can determine, and there are structured way also to do it, whether this problem or this challenge can be solved by more data, different data, different compute, they will be able to reduce the research iteration. Second is they should be able to understand the metrics very well. So whoever is managing a ML project, if it is a ML project manager, if they do not understand the ML matrices well, they will have hard time managing ML project. And some of the matrices can become a little bit complex, like even, like even matrices like NDCG, which is used in search engine, normalized discounted cumulative gain, or blue score, or blue score in um, uh, speech, as well as in translation. So a project manager should be able to understand the matrix well. They should be able to understand that if they have a certain score in training environment versus validation, what it means. If they have a certain score in training and validation and but now production matrices are different, uh, what kind of a issue um, um, these matrices are indicating. So managing the ML project require ML skill. If a unskilled project manager is managing this, these projects generally fail and it doesn't produce result. So um, most company does this mistake that they hire data scientists because they think they will be able to write code and they assign a traditional project manager uh, and it doesn't work that way. If the management chain doesn't understand ML, the chances of success is very low. Okay. So just to summarize it again, so, um, because models are developed on um, data, model development and software developments are different. And when you build models, it has a code, it has a data, and you build your process, do not treat data object as code object and keep just simply copying into different environment. Um, when you are dealing with big data, you will not be able to copy this in different environment. Compliance regulation will also not allow you to copy and it will become unmanageable. So try to come, a, come out with a different philosophy, uh, how you will handle the data and still be able to um, run it, the things into different environment. Uh, also think about uh, modularity versus accuracy. Like if you get 76% accuracy with 10 feature and with 100 feature, you get 77%, is it worth it? Um, and uh, then uh, integrate your modeling with your BI um, because that also sometimes help in debugging. Okay. Okay, so now we talked about um, how to set up ML project. We then talked about experimentation, how you can run thousands of experiment using orthogonal knobs. Um, now let's uh, consider like how to handle the data problem. So one lesson learned, uh, and this is a very important lesson, is um, um, every company has data and they're collecting more data, but they do not have label. And even if they have label, labels are costly. So Netflix um, had a quote somewhere that even if they hire uh, all humans on the planet, they will not be having enough labelers for annotating videos. So again, we, we learn things by using annotated data, but in real life, annotated data is very hard and it becomes harder and harder in um, videos and, and text, or if you build more complex problem. And uh, each data label has a different importance. So one of the uh, lesson learned is, can you learn with less amount of data? So everyone wants to use big data, that's great. Uh, but when you, when you are using supervised learning, when you are using label, uh, try to see, can you learn with less amount of label data? So one of the machine learning approach um, we use is called active learning. Uh, how it works is, um, you start with a small label data set, you, you produce a classifier, 
and then that classifier tells you which data point are more complex or it, it is most uncertain about. And then you go and label certain of those point. And as a result with less amount of labels, you can get more result. And this approach we used it at Microsoft and um, because uh, they didn't had labels like Google and later Google also adopted it, Google Maps or a variety of project use active learning, uh, Yahoo, Microsoft, Netflix, all these companies use this approach um, active learning to intelligently determine what to label. We also combine this with weak supervision. Many times um, uh, you will start a project and you will not have labels. Um, and um, um, using weak supervision, you can create some labels, you can get the result and or you can combine actual label with weak supervision generated labels, you will get some result and later you can combine this with active learning. So uh, learn uh, how you, you can use active learning. I will go a bit fast because we are behind the time. The things on feature store features. Um, so every team spend a lot of time in building features. And if you are building three or four model in different area, every, every modeling team has their own feature. And sometimes features are simply uh, code that you are taking average of certain feature or you are doing normalization. That's okay, but in real life, the features became more and more complex. Like um, let's say if you are, um, uh, if you have a complex time series data and um, you later on figure it out how to take um, 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 data about 10 week period and combine them into a feature, um, it may take you six weeks to develop. So uh, consider features as module and um, put features into feature store. So this is an area where you um, put your uh, features for future you, you reuse as well as for shareability so that each team is not creating their features again and again with uh, different names. Um, so um, um, building feature store um, helps us and like, uh, um, um, so generally um, features are use software. So you can use SDLC process, you can train your data engineer to um, build feature, you can uh, use all of the SDLC process uh, and um, uh, then um, once you put together all the features, push them into a formal feature store and so that other, other modeling team can use it or you can also uh, reuse it in, um, um, in other projects. Okay, so, um, and it will also improve your uh, governance process. Like many times there are teams that uh, evaluate your model, but if your features are common, then evaluating your model becomes also much simpler. So I'm going this a little bit fast on this. So, um, so this is the reason you build a feature store so that you have one place where you are pushing all of your feature. So it reduces your cost, feature becomes reproducible and they become well governed. Okay. Um, the modeling architecture, um, again, I will use simple analogy and will not go into detail. So let's say somebody ask you that, uh, can you build a recommendation model for movies? And then somebody asks you that, okay, can you build recommendation model for houses, buying houses? Um, uh, in software, this seems like a similar use cases and companies also come and say, oh, if, you, if you've done movie recommendation, can you do house recommendation? Or you may read, uh, read a movie recommendation paper and try to apply on house recommendation. The, the key thing is um, model depends upon data. Uh, you watch, I don't know, 20, 30 movies in a, uh, year, you do not buy 20, 30 houses in a year. So the sparsity of the data um, in house is much higher. The shape of the house data is, um, is very different than the movie data. So even if these use cases looks similar, they are actually very different use cases. So when you convert a business use case to ML use case, as we discussed in the beginning, consider the shape and sparsity of data and determine which use cases are similar and which use cases um, are, are, are different. Uh, and then accordingly read those paper and uh, focus on those architecture. So we talked about like classification, regression kind of algorithms. This is just a um, very simple 
uh, hello world kind of like what kind of algorithms were there but the key is plurality of method in ml system is very high depending upon your shape and sparsity you will have to modify the algorithm or the modeling architecture so understand your shape and data and then determine which paper you should be reading or which architecture you should be applying okay uh, the operationalization piece so this was a, a little bit old survey by mckenzie that 88% of the ml system doesn't go to prod um, and uh, so Operationalization of ML system is hard as we discussed earlier, like you need to combine software data and ML diagnostic uh, and operationalization um, at one place. And um, you should also consider like how ML is used um, uh, in production. So let's say when you go to Amazon site, it recommend you product or when you go to Google search or Bing, um, you search something uh, and you directly take an action and then it continue to learn. So the um, based upon what action you are taking, it is learning for um, model is learning. And after a few hours, the model will show you the um, result based upon what you what action you took in the past. So there is a closed loop um, versus there may be other scenario where um, model is producing an output and a, a employee is consuming it. For example, if, a, if you send complaint to some company, they generally have a uh, classification of those complaints. So a human will be consuming it. And even if your classification was incorrect, that human will correct it. So consider those aspects, uh, how business will be using it, whether it is a closed loop or it is a human consuming um, the model accordingly, put the uh, right operationalization process. And um, as you build a complex ML system that has code as well as data and ML code, fits on data, but remaining code is a software engineering code. So you need to use SDLC process for the remaining pieces, but you need to use a different process for uh, ML. However, these needs to be integrated um, 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 because uh, you may not be able to create copies of data in every environment. So if this piece was not machine learning, you can just <coughs> Uh, deploy all the code into different environment and test it. But once you are dealing with the such system, you need to design them in a different way. Okay, okay so this is a summary of uh, uh, technical challenges we get um, in operationalization. Like many times, feature engineering doesn't match in training and inference. This is a common cause of failure. Um, and uh, multiple loosely coupled pipeline exist. Um, and uh, as a result, the feature um, feature doesn't produce the right result. And these pipeline have dependencies and many times these dependency uh, require human intervention. And those pipeline have uh, a sequel of um, many joins. So, um, um, and um, uh, so here I'm just calling out variety of technical challenges we have seen. It's not a solution. It is like set of technical challenges we have seen. And then we'll talk about um, that you should consider how to simplify this. Like if, if you are building a mission critical system, you have jungle of SQL join and loosely coupled pipeline is probably not ready for mission critical system. Again, uh, this is a one hour topic in itself. How to uh, write test cases for um, those five um, types of uh, uh, target we discuss in, um, in in the early phase. So uh, you should consider uh, like how to reduce these pipeline dependencies. And then um, there are different framework for pipeline. There are different framework for big data and then ML. Combining this framework also produce a lot of challenges. Um, and um, again, going back to like, you will be using testing your code and somewhere you will be testing your code plus data together and different data will impact. So end-to-end um, -end process there also can be complex. And then um, other um, challenges will be, um, you have to run experiments, not only in the beginning, but you may be running experiment in production like A-B testing that also produced um, additional challenges and then um, all of these require variety of skills that you will have data engineer, you will have software engineer, you have data scientist, you will have researcher, you will have statistician. So they all use different processes. So this is a summary of variety of technical challenge. If you are lead on a 
uh, ML project, or if you are starting a company and you want to operationalize the ML, consider these challenges, how you will solve this. Okay. Um, so uh, this is again a summary of that um, um, these challenges like uh, consider how you will do um, integration testing of your end-to-end -end pipeline, which include data as well as model as uh, model code. Um, and then you should have a reproducible way of retraining the ML data. You should be able to evaluate the model. You should have things like rolling back if your model is not giving the result. You, uh, uh, you should be able to debug and diagnose, specifically if you, have, if you are running a mission critical system, model rollback and debugging and diagnosis are very important. And there are very, very few companies who have robust uh, automated debugging and diagnostic procedure in place. Okay. Um, and um, as you are operationalizing your monitoring, you should consider like how you will handle skewness in data, staleness in data, how you will handle model validation. So, um, we were over time, so I went a little bit fast. Um, we are done for today. Um, I will not go through um, psychology versus um, AI, but uh, yeah, <laughs> let's let's determine whether you have a few questions. Yes, Prashant, thank you for this session. A lot of questions are waiting for you in the QA section. Okay, sorry, I was um, um, sorry if I should have took this question in the beginning. How should I refer the, uh, go to the QA session? Uh, okay, in the chat window? And QA. QA, okay, got it. Okay. So, how did we get better infection feature? That is question number one. And then there's another question. Um, our limited exposure, okay, what is when? Okay, so what do you mean by infection feature? I think Ashok asked this question. The other question is, um, when my model is deployed to production and there is a data drift in the inference pipeline, how to retrain the model so that model performance doesn't degrade? So uh, many of these questions doesn't have a like a simple answer. For example, if you have a data drift, um, it, it means like um, retraining alone may not be enough. Now, if there is a regime shift happen in the data, you may require different features altogether, or you may require different labels uh, if the layer, uh, concept drift has happened. So if there is a data drift, that means um, your training and production uh, data are very different. So you need to either now use production data with production label, and you need to prove that, okay, feasibility wise that it works and then you need to evaluate the matrix and then, then take the model to production. Okay. Um, I didn't understand the meaning of infection feature. So how, how do we get better feature? You try variety of features or many times you use DNN and you then figure it out which features are playing a role. Um, there are few approaches to use automated feature selection, you can use those. So I'm ignoring the word infection, but if there is a word, uh, if there is a meaning of infection, do let me know. Do business company allows to use NLP to build model? Yes, like there are so many companies specializing in NLP. Every company nowadays use NLP, so companies allow, <coughs> allow you to use NLP. Are there any framework to build? Other question is, are there any framework to build an ML solution similar to what we have for web development or mobile app? So TensorFlow, PyTorch are framework for ML. You will use ML to produce a model and then consider your model as one component and then you use same framework, uh, whether it is um, um, whichever framework, uh, Django or 
some other framework uh, you are using to build app, use use those framework. Um, then your model is nothing but an API. Uh, can you please share a reference architecture in a mission critical system? Yeah, those reference architecture can be like uh, very complex. Uh, I will post on uh, some generic form on my website, uh, prashant.dhingra.website. I do not have it handy here. Um, what are the best practice for data science project estimation? So as I said earlier, um, many times you need to first prove feasibility. Um, I have a YouTube video, how to manage ML project. I've shared these things there, but I will post this um, answer to this question and the YouTube video link uh, onto my website, prashant.dhingra.website. I'll post it there. Um, in your view, would agile development methodology work well for ML project? Uh, as there will be always elephant tasks, which are, yes. So we use agile development method. Um, um, the thing is one should be aware that uh, in many times, even in agile development method, there is an expectation that, okay, the task can be completed. And if it is not completed, you can add more resources. Data science tasks sometimes are not additive. That means uh, just adding two more resources may not solve the problem if it is a data problem or uh, if the model mm -hmm. training. So be aware of those factors, but otherwise, yes, agile development method can be used there. Since experiment cannot guarantee to find solution, the next question I'm reading is within the time box scrum sprint, how should acceptance criteria be defined for ML stories in agile? So this is the tricky part again, um, answer to this is we need to educate our executives that um, outcome of experiment is not guaranteed. So if executives have, many times this happen uh, when executives are new and they think, uh, oh, I have defined this use case and by next month you need to have this result, that top-down approach doesn't work. So, um, outcome of experiment, you can't guarantee. Uh, if you can guarantee the outcome, you, you should not be wasting money on experiment, then you should directly go to the execution. Um, the one, another question I have is, uh, how do we test a model in QA UAT in software development before prod? So in QA and UAT, um, uh, you will first test model in experimentation for evaluation purpose, but in QA and UAT, you will test that, okay, your system uh, model works with your application. And then you will also test that, okay, your model accuracy has not deteriorated. Um, so those are the kind of things you will test it in QA and U UAT um, before you deploy to prod. Uh, if you are running a mission critical system, you may have a separate uh, QA, U QA or UAT where you basically um, have a gold data set and you will like to evaluate the model before it gets rolled out to production. And, and let me expand this question again. There can be two kinds of QA and UAT. One is whenever you are changing the model code and you want to test it. The other is every day or every week if you are retraining the model. So you may want to have a QA or uh, environment for that also. So once a model gets retrained, you test it on a gold set and ensure that it accuracy is not deteriorating. Okay, the next question is, can you please share more detail on active learning? Yes, so active learning, it's a big topic in itself. I will post slide on my uh, website, prashanthingra.website. Um, uh, but this, is, this topic can be another 30 minute topic in itself, okay? Uh, next question is, um, as a student, I'm not working on a business problem. So how should I select the research paper to study a problem based upon algorithm? So um, you can take any Kaggle problem or, or uh, reach out to me on um, my website or prashantkdhingra at gmail.com. Uh, I can share some example of project. You can find such project on, uh, on Kaggle also or uh, I can share some example project uh, which has data set. Uh, they are public data set and uh, um, going through them will ha help you 
um, um, help you build data science scale in NLP domain or in a structured data domain. Okay. So Kaggle has variety of data set and project. I can share few detail on my website or send me an email and I will reply to you. The next question is, what was your strategy to get into the field of data science when you first applied for the job? So I was in a software engineer and um, I ended up taking a job in operationalizing ML in 2008. And uh, that's how I got into um, data science. So I was operationalizing ML model when we operationalize it. Fortunately, they were mission critical. So we have to then debug. And once we started debugging, we understand data. So I had exp expertise in data and software and slowly then I learned machine learning and then I did variety of courses and later also uh, did MS in uh, data science. Okay. How to, next question is how to combine two different approaches in machine learning. So um, uh, as you build your experimentation environment, you can replace one algorithm with another algorithm or you can add one feature and or try three different features. <laughs> so that's how you combine. So once you have once you have a use case and a matrix, you can combine variety of features or variety of algorithms and compare which one is giving you the result. Okay. Another question is how to get a job. So again, um, you need to gain some experience by doing some project or if you have a degree, then you can apply a job into a data science. If you have a degree in software engineering, you can get into software engineering and then do a project. And that's how you can um, you can get a job. Uh, another question is, is linear regression used when we have neural network and DNN? So all these techniques are used, like in some projects, linear regression is easy to use and it's easy to explain. Um, and um, when complexity increases, then you use DNN. Okay, next question is, um, can you share your website name again? Yeah, so I can type it into a chat window. Yeah, uh, yes, sir, we have shared on the chat window. I'll yeah. share it again. Yeah, so currently it is almost empty. It just has a um, um, few PDFs that are hidden, um, but uh, give me a couple of days, uh, I will, make those link, uh, I will add those link on the homepage. Okay, so give me a couple of uh, days and uh, you will see. Um, uh, it, my website was actually prashan.dhingra.mobi earlier and then I am in the process of migrating. So uh, I will try to do it over weekend or by next week, you will have all the information there. Okay. Um, and um, few of the link you may be able to find. Um, so this is more of my resume, but it has link to many of these. But um, the first one, prashant.dhingra.website, I will put together a homepage with all the links. Give me two days. Okay, I have a model trained with thousands of data each day. So I'm getting 100 new data. So every day I have to train my model with new data, how to solve this. I didn't understand this question. Like uh, if you have a data, if you're getting newer data, yes, you should be putting together a training pipeline and automatically it can retrain on a newer data. But let's say if your data is not changing, then you do not have to train on new data. You can train once in a while. Okay, so this is another uh, philosophy that you should, as you design your ML system, you should um, determine whether you need to train every few hour, every day, every week, every month, uh, when your data patterns are going to change. So in Bing search, we used to train every six hours. Um, and um, um, uh, But in some system, let's say, um, uh, if there is a text classification system, one can only train once in a week. Um, uh, if you are receiving, let's say, customer complaint and those type of complaints or type of feedback is not changing once in a week or once in a month is also okay. Um, okay, which project, uh, another question is, um, which project to choose to try? Uh, again, Kaggle has variety of projects. Uh, I can I can write few recommendation and then depending upon the maturity you have in data science, you, you want to pick a project that is more complex than the current one. So that's how you should 
PK project. Um, any best, another question is any best feature selection technique? A feature selection is very domain specific. So this is an area where you should work with domain expert or you should learn that data. You should do the EDA analysis that will tell it to you what kind of features are playing a role. Um, and then there are a few techniques where you can put variety of features and then determine which features are contributing to the model accuracy and which features are not contributing to model accuracy. On my website, uh, I have a PDF for explainability. It has those example, I will, I will put its um, link. Um, it is written in the form of explainability context, but it uses, it uses the wine example, which features in wine make wine better quality. And it has some of these techniques of feature selection. Um, one question is I learned ML and AI as self learner, but how I can transit into a product manager? Um, yeah, this is true. Like you need to have an experience um, or if you, um, if you work uh, with some startup um, or if you build a portfolio, again, um, industry look for experience and many times um, you need to show that by doing some project. Uh, I will put some examples on my, uh, on my website, if you try to do those, and if you show those examples, some companies may be keen to um, uh, take you as a start starting product manager. But I, I will I'll put some info on my slide uh, on my website on this. Um, how to start a career in data science? I already answered. Uh, I think most of the questions are now um, related to this. And somebody has a question on um, data science course. Um, how, but the question is how and where I can reach to projects. So uh, Kaggle has got good portfolio of project. Okay, one more suggestion. Um, if, if you have some expertise and interested, uh, I earlier wrote a book on flood prediction and um, uh, many times the variety of nonprofit reach out to me to build this um, or take this further. So if you are interested, I can also get you connected with some nonprofit um, organization to do real data science project. So um, uh, please send me an email or uh, um, you will, um, 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 I've typed it here. Uh, if you are working, um, if you want to work on a nonprofit project, so these will be the real project, which are not on Kaggle, and these will actually got deployed. And um, 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 like, um, it will benefit you as well as the nonprofit, nonprofit companies. Okay, so I think we covered most of the uh, question. The last question is, can you send the slides? Yeah, I will put, put the slide on my website and you can download it from there. Okay, yeah. I think we are done for today. Uh, once again, thanks for the opportunity. Very great, very nice to meet all of you here. And um, uh, I will upload the material as well as more info on my website. It doesn't, I'm in the process of migrating. Give me a couple of days. I'll put it there. And, uh, or um, if you have more questions, reach out to me or email specifically if you want to do project for nonprofit. Thanks Prashant. Thanks. That was a wonderful session. Now Thanks, I would sir. request everyone to fill their feedbacks. I have pasted the link in the chat window.